Welcome to the first of our multi-part series on the business of booze, where we dive deep into the different aspects of the alcohol market here in Asia. What tickles the taste buds here? How big is the market really? Is it about taste, prestige, image, or a little bit of everything? In our first episode, we're looking at whiskey. Strong, peaty, and expensive. I'm your host, Shashank Bengali, and I can't wait to have a drink. To help me along this journey, I needed some expert advice. And who better to guide me than a group of whiskey connoisseurs, among them writers, bar owners, and whiskey distributors. So guys, what is it about whiskey? What draws each of you to this particular spirit? We all here are particularly into single malt whiskies. All of them are made with nothing but barley, water, yeast, and thyme. And you have this incredible diversity of flavor and aroma. Every one of them is different, and there's literally thousands to try. And that's just something that's really fun to explore. Really very much, uh, whiskey is about uh, togetherness. <coughs> it's about friends. It's about talk, you know, and catching up, and yeah. stuff like that. You know, it's a very social drink. Uh, I think it brings people together. I think it was when talking about the Prohibition era, was a judge, I think it was, it was Judge Noah, he said it is the philosopher's wine. Uh, and I agree with that. It brings people together, you discuss, you debate, like what Matthew mentioned earlier, how did barley, yeast, water, and thyme give it so much diversity of flavors? And then you live through each other's uh, experiences. So let me bring in Matthew here. You're, you've been distributing whiskeys for many years now. Um, how, talking about taste, how have the taste changed? What are the tastes like now compared to a few years ago? What do you see happening in the market? Look, I, I think today there's uh, more of an appreciation for something different. You know, if, if we go back in Singapore, say 10, 15 years, all you could really get here was, uh, apart from your big blends like your Johnny Walker and your Shivers, you could get McAllen and Glenfiddich and Glenlivet. There really wasn't a lot here, right? More and more companies and more and more bars have brought in different stuff. And there's been a real maturation of, of the palate. <laughs> I think people have learned that whiskey can be so diverse, it can be so broad. Jeremy, you're a bar manager, so you've got people coming into your bar. A lot of them are just gonna come to drink anyway, right? So, but part of what you'd like to do, I know, is you like to help educate people, talk them through their, their choices, yeah, what's yeah. out there, what they like. How has that experience been like, and do you find that people are asking different kinds of questions? Is there more of an appreciation of whiskey than there used to be? People are more open to whiskeys right now. That that's, that's a... Uh, um, few bars that's, that's been open throughout, throughout these five years, mm -hmm. kind of thing that, that we bring in like stuffs that people never seen before, mm -hmm. and people are more, much more open on trying new stuff or vintage stuff from uh, this one song. It, and even for myself, we, we, we bring in like independent bo bottlings uh, as well. So what kind of people are coming into Swan Song? What's your customer profile? Well, mm. uh, <laughs> I, I, I would disagree that it is a, it is a high-end uh, clientele. I don't think whiskey should be elitist. I think when it becomes like that, that's the real danger because the young people start losing interest. Really, I would say it's really a lot of the middle class. Right. We're drinking the really what we call expensive whiskey. I know plenty of people that uh, don't, own, don't own a huge amount of money, but the exploration of whiskey is important to them. So they will spend a lot of their fairly limited disposable income Priorities. on a special whiskey, right? That's your target market. You don't have to be wealthy to enjoy what is actually quite an expensive whiskey. Yeah. And, and conversely, you have extremely rich people who cannot venture out of drinking Black Label. That's right. It's a question about passion, interest, exploration. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. To understand this multifaceted appeal of whiskey, I headed over to the Old Alliance, a bar specializing in rare bottles of whiskey with a staggering collection of over 1,500 bottles. Owner Emmanuel Drawn is something of a whiskey savant, and it was also a good chance for me to finally have a drink. Mm very different. You feel the waves of the sea coming from the... <laughs> I can almost hear the ocean. It's, yes, it's exactly. So, Emmanuel, I'm just boggled by the selection that you have here at, at your bar. Uh, a lot of drinkers would probably be familiar with names like McAllen, Yamazaki, but your collection goes so much deeper. Mm -hmm. Explain a bit to me how you came to acquire this and, and what it all means. Uh, so, I've been working in the whiskey industry for almost 25 years now and uh, always specialize in... Uh, single malt 
With the time, I've been more and more specialized in uh, old bottle, vintage bottle. What makes a vintage bottle? Uh, when we talk about vintage among the collector or whiskey lover, it means it's the old style of whiskey. So it's a way where the whiskey was produced, it was different from today. So it can be the type of yeast, the type of fermentation, so the type of cask use, uh, which is which has change. If you take a whiskey like Beaumont, for example, people are craving for Beaumont distilling from the 50s and 60s. And is Asia the only place where you see that kind of interest? I mean, you wouldn't find this in Europe and North America for No, whiskey. Europe, I think we are, okay. Europe have a much more mature market in terms of whiskey for a long time. Asia is, a, is quite a special market for it. We have many, many good bars in Hong Kong. Uh, Japan is a paradise for, for that. Japan has been the oldest market for 40 years with bar for all bottle. So tell me a bit, you're talking about what the market is today. What is the average whiskey drinker like in Asia that, that you count as part of your clientele? What's the profile? We just opened a rare bottle of whiskey last week and we see people, in one week, we have people who flew from Taiwan, from Hong Kong, from China, just to come to try that whiskey. So it is quite crazy. Incredible. If you think about it, it's to say, just for that bottle, I will book an hotel, I will book a flight, and just to come here and try one whiskey. You see very different uh, kind of customer. We have a group of young girls, like 25 years old, that will come here and drink, take a tasting set and try to understand. And then you have more and more, I will call like whiskey geek. And see you with people will really go deep and try to understand uh, not only about the process of elaboration or the aroma, but go down, go deep in, town, in time and uh, drink a Macallan from today compared with a Macallan from the 1980s and then from the 50s. And so you have a lot of passionate people. You have a fantastic community. The increasingly sophisticated palate of whiskey lovers here has given rise to a variety of whiskey bars. Some, like Old Alliance, where drinkers get a history lesson together with the vintage dram. And then something new, like the single cask, which features lesser known distilleries and independent bottlers. I sat with Brendan Pillai, bar manager at the Single Cask, to find out more. What's different drinking a single cask whiskey compared to a single malt? At the very base of it, it is a snapshot of a distillery's character. The thing is, the majority of distilleries out there that produce your larger whiskey, such as your Macallan, your Glenfiddich, your Glen, uh, Glendivitt, these distilleries actually vet hundreds or thousands of casks together to create a uniform product. Whereas for us, we don't really have the luxury of buying that many casks. We are, of course, constrained by not just the economic side of things, but also by the um, sustainability point of, uh, point of view. And in this case, um, sometimes we may get at most one cast, if we're lucky, two. So the idea with a single cast, of course, is that we provide that representation of a distillery style that may not necessarily be the distillery style uh, per se. We prefer the variants. We want to showcase and highlight that variance in there. Singapore in general, of course, over the last 10 years has grown quite a bit and people are a lot more receptive over trying different things. So the taste speaks for itself, yes, but sir. I'm wondering if your kind of really hardcore whiskey drinkers would look down on this type of production, this type of bottling. To be honest, over the last few years, there has been quite a bit of a focus shift. People are exactly, uh, not exactly um, averse to trying these things. So, for example, giving them you know, distilleries that are relatively well known, they may have seen these in um, official bottlings. Um, out there, either in duty free or in a retail shop, it gives them that sense of comfort, so they can actually do some uh, a certain sense of uh, association to these bottlings as well. They come in, they get to try something different, and I think most of it's born out of that spirit of adventure. Um, a lot of our customers actually walk in primarily because they know that everything that we have behind here is going to be fundamentally different from what they're actually used to. The whiskey market is driven by the drinkers themselves. So what do they have to say about the state of the industry? I met with Yuhun the self-professed whiskey lover and collector, to browse his collection and to understand the significant investment value of a good bottle of whiskey. Well, Yoon, thanks so much for having me. It's great to, to meet you and great to- Pleasure to, to have you, Shashank. Yeah. Your amazing collection. So tell me, how did you get into whiskey? When did it start? Back in 2016, I used to go to Tokyo a lot. And literally how I started was uh, with one of these. So okay. it's a Yamazaki 12, just I, a five I've CL bottle. Right. And uh, we used to just uh, drink this after our yakitori or whatever that was. Mm -hmm. um, and then I realized, um, hey, it's not, it's not too bad. It's pretty good. And so from then to now, 
talk about your collection. How big is it, and, and what does it reflect? How many different uh, regions? How many different areas? When I first started, um, I liked a couple of distilleries, so Springbank and Port Ellen. So I do have some memorable bottles from those two distilleries. Um, I used to have more bottles, so maybe three to four hundred. But um, I think in the last uh, year and a half, I've kind of um, skinny that down to really more essential bottles. And did you drink the others? Did you give them to friends? Did you sell them? Oh, I drank a lot. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think that's the best way to learn. Um, that's the beauty of whiskey is is being able to try um, whiskeys from different regions, different distilleries, and and then just making your own uh, opinions. And so you're not buying them to keep them on a shelf, you're actually buying to, to drink and to taste and enjoy. Originally when I started, um, everything was for, for drinking, you know, and everything was like, hey guys, come over and let's have a couple drams. Um, and then I realized um, after, after some time that uh, the whiskeys that I bought six months ago or a year ago actually started going up in price. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where it became a bit more difficult to open up the same bottles that you did a year ago, for example. Um, and that transcended into collecting. And so talk about Singapore and, and Asia in general now from what you've seen in your travels. How is this as a, a whiskey market, a place to try uh, different distilleries, uh, check out different bars, different shops? What is the market like now compared to when you started, say, collecting? So I think it's all relative. I think back three years ago, um, we would say a glass of whiskey at a hundred bucks was really expensive, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we would actually think two, three times before, and sometimes we might even um, share a glass just so that we could try certain types of whiskey. Um, I think over the last uh, two, three years, the, the market's exploded, uh, especially in 2018, where uh, a lot of whiskeys reached record prices. You know, you'd see your million dollar McAllen's last year, which never happened before. I think in Asia, because a lot of us are not too exposed or, you know, it's a more recent thing in the last maybe five years, five to seven years, um, we're more used to high prices. So with clear economic potential in whiskey, I asked Emmanuel for some advice on how to invest in this rapidly growing market. The whiskey has been an amazing investment for people who have bought some bottle uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, even 10 years ago, even five years ago. If you buy, a, if you bought Karuzawa uh, for, I don't know, I, I bought some bottle for $300 and they are today for $10,000. So it's a crazy, it's a time 30 in five years. So it's a very crazy investment. So if someone come to see me just for investment, my only thing I will say, I will say, first you need to drink and like whiskey. And then you buy what you like and you consider what you want to drink because uh, not like the stock market. If the stock market crash, bo, it's too bad. If the, if the whiskey market crash, you still can drink your bottle. So at least choose good whiskey you like to drink. Like we have here on the shelf, uh, Colila 1968. It's a 50 years old. I think it's the last cast from the old distillery. They destroyed the distillery, rebuilt a new one. It's a very limited number, so the whiskey I think is amazing. You have very high chance that you will make money one day if you want to resell your bottle because you will never get that bottle again. So then what's the future uh, of whiskey collecting? Do you see the prices uh, changing the way people collect? I think where we're headed is, um, is it's going to be a scenario where we have escalating prices still for the, the really, really rare bottles, the top 1%. Hopefully, you know, there's a, there's still a lot to drink in the world. I mean, that's the positive that I take away. That's very good news. But but if it means that people are going to open up their collections, it, it, does that tell you that there will still be rare bottles out there? And we're not at risk of running out of these old bottles? I think we'll run out someday because some of these bottles, for example, those on top, um, it's 250 bottles, um, bottled in the 1980s, 1990s. A lot of the bottles were already open, so you probably have less than 30 or 40 today. So it seemed to me that at one end of the market, there was definitely some hand-wringing among connoisseurs and collectors about vintages. In a sense, doomed to either disappear by being opened and drunk, or perhaps even worse, kept unopened like a museum piece priced beyond reach because of its rarity. 
So perhaps it was time to get back to the essence of the drink itself, a great taste and the community that surrounds it. So how would one get into the game, so to speak? I think just hearing you guys talk about what you like to drink, the way you got into it has made me think that anybody could really find an interest in, and pursue it. So if you're advising or, you know, there's a man or woman out there who is interested in trying whiskey for the first time, maybe they've just, you know, bought a bottle of Duty Free or they've been to a wedding and tried something or they just happened to be in a bar and get yeah. a cocktail. What is, I mean, if somebody wanted to learn more about it and really get into it, what's the best way to do that? Every sip counts. All whiskey or wine or whatever, you know, treat it like food. What are you tasting? Okay. Go beyond the label, go beyond the price. We, we get this a lot, like people flying through the airport and they, they, they send a message, yeah, yeah, yeah. what should I pick up yes, at yes, EFS, yes, 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 yes. right? Or, yes, yes, or, or yes. travel retail. And then you're like, Chibas! That's like <laughs> a few hundred expressions there. I'm, I'm exactly. not in the capacity to advise you right now. The, the, the best advice I give, if, if you're not familiar, just pick up a bottle that you feel comfortable with, right? And then you start from there. Yeah. I, I think every journey starts with that single step. And if you find a bottle that you don't like, when the next time you, you, you step into a, a really, really good whiskey bar, explain to them why you didn't like what you, what you picked, and then they will be able to advise you what you probably would like. So they say if you want to be good at something, do it for 10,000 hours? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Not drink, drink whiskey for 10,000 hours. Yeah. Cheers, Chris. But never drink and drive. <laughs>